Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Hugo Groves, uh, Barrister from Enterprise Chambers, to join um, our web seminar this afternoon from the last Muckle LLP. I've had the pleasure of working with Hugo over a number of years and have uh, appreciated his insightful approach to insolvency litigation and the uh, attempts that we've made to um, work together on cases and produce successful results. I'd like to hand you over to Hugo for now at this stage to commence the web seminar which we'll call Insolvency Practitioners and Litigation. It's designed to run through some of the more practical points um, that crop up on cases that Hugo's been involved with um, with a view to sort of providing you with that information. So thanks very much for joining us today. There may be some interference on the line, there's still some residual people logging in, but as I say, we're going to kick off now and, and start the main part of the talk. Um, the estimated time is, is roughly an hour, uh, although it may be, may be less, but we are going to run through the material that's being presented on the slide. Just a general, um, a general uh, point at this stage. Um, we would appreciate if everyone can continue to keep their phones muted um, as part of the log-on. Um, if you do have questions, and we do very much welcome this being an interactive session, so if you have a question that you'd like to pose to Hugo, I do have Hugo's permission to interrupt him um, during the call to pose questions to, 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 to him. So as I say, if anything you'd like to put to us, please send it through on the chat. We are very best to manage that and try and um, relay those questions at the appropriate moment. Um, what we're going to do is follow up the webinar with some um, post-webinar materials, which um, I'll deal with at the end of the seminar, and that will give you some information about what uh, we expect to happen uh, next. But as I say, at this stage, I'd like to hand you over to Hugo now uh, to commence the um, the. Uh, the oh. Thank you uh, very much, Andrew, and uh, welcome to uh, everybody. And uh, as Andrew has just said, I'm quite happy uh, to uh, for you to. Uh, send questions into my um, wonderful assistant here, Andrew Corkwell, uh, uh, through the um, uh, through the uh, web question. Uh, and um, as we go along, because I know rather than leaving it all to the end, whatever you're more comfortable with, uh, there's a lot of brains um, attending this seminar. So if you want to as well share a question or share a query or a comment, then please do. And uh, Andrew's going to. I've been looking at them and, and hopefully interrupting me uh, uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, the second point is that you ought to have, uh, I think some notes were sent to you ahead of this seminar. Uh, I'll make references throughout the seminar to a number of uh, cases and a number of section numbers. And if you haven't uh, got a printed hard copy of them uh, to one side, don't worry. I'll just give you a, a name reference of a case, for instance, and you can pick up on it uh, later. Uh, so uh, don't be too concerned if you can't take down uh, every reference that I, I, I might um, uh, give you. Um, so with, with that in mind, if you look to the first slide, I've entitled it Minimizing Litigation Risks. Minimizing Litigation Risks. And I've put down a few um, uh, headers there uh, for the purposes of, of considering how you minimize a litigation risk. Well, the obvious thing to do um, as an insolvency practitioner is to actually avoid litigation, if you possibly can. And so that means engaging very early on in, in assessing the legal basis and the legal strength of your case with your legal advisors and seeing actually whether you can just avoid going to court. Uh, I do realize, oh yeah, it's very easy to say to a client, um, just issue some proceedings. But as an insolvency practitioner, you uh, could well be on the line personally for costs. And so a, con a real concern, obviously, for you is to limit any litigation risk. And the best, the best way of limiting something in this scenario is actually to uh, avoid it. And there are situations, clearly, where you can't avoid um, issuing an application for directions or issuing certain proceedings. Um, uh, clearly, but there are then ways in which we can um, hopefully um, direct your attention to uh, minimizing any, any potential problem. Uh, so um, the first thing uh, that I mentioned there are assignments. 
Now, actually, it is an area of, of, of um, interest here in relation to uh, causes of action uh, vested in the company. You can actually uh, sell, uh, uh, and so you, you normally would sell them by making an assignment. So that means you get rid of that right of action and you get some realisation in. So that's a potential. The second thing is to look to entering some type of uh, damage limitation agreement, if I can put it that way, with your legal advisors, such as a conditional fee agreement or now recently introduced a damage-based agreement. And so I'll be looking at a couple of issues in relation to CSAs and DBAs. Uh, and and a, a third um, point, and it's not, a, it's not in the heading on the slide, but is your choice of legal advisors. And I think this is actually extremely important. Um, you've got a, a, a wide variety of solicitors and counsel to choose from. It's one benefit of our system of split profession. We play, play rather different roles as a solicitor and a barrister. But in any work that I've been involved in with, with, with as were regular uh, uh, clients and, and, and people that you trust, you have to approach. If you're going into a piece of litigation, you want to make sure that people are with you in good times as well as in bad times. One of the biggest cases I actually took over from a barrister who, after uh, uh, doing a considerable amount of work on the case, decided he didn't want to go on with it any further. It was a good case. It was complicated. It was not going to be a short-haul flight by any means. But uh, the solicitor and the insolvency practitioner were actually left in, in a quandary, and they had to seek alternative counsel. Uh, and particularly the solicitor in that case was deeply embarrassed that his choice of counsel had not been had not stayed the distance. Now, I've similarly had experience, um, not so barristers dropping off the uh, team, as it were, but also solicitors who have decided um, they haven't pushed it hard enough, and I'm sure you've got all your own experiences of that. And insolvency practitioners. I've had a couple of uh, situations where people have wanted work done with the solicitor and the barrister and myself, in, in these cases, have done the work, and then it's decided actually they don't want to proceed with the litigation because, for instance, um, a trading job has come up or something like that. The moral of the story is if you're going to litigate, it's very important to, to have those people um, uh, all together singing from the same hymn sheet. Now, if you look to your notes on assignments, I can just say a little bit more about assignments. It's paragraph two a reference there to the Oasis case. And the point there is, you can assign causes of action in the name of the company and realize monies, but you can't sell office holder claims. So the Oasis claim, for instance, is wrongful trading. You can't as a liquidator, I'm talking here as a liquidator, obviously, for wrongful trading, although equally it can apply to an administrator on the transaction at an undervalue. Um, you can't sell that right of action, so Mr. X buys it off the administrator and Mr. X runs the action. And what you can do in those situations is you can make an agreement to share the fruits of the recovery. You, as liquidator, will take the office holder claim, let's say the wrongful trading claim, but you can make an agreement with somebody that when you recover, uh, you will split that 50-50 or 70-30 or, or what have you. But Oasis has made clear you cannot assign an office holder claim. So assignments don't work in all cases. Uh, clearly, there's a big gap there on office holder claims. And as the, I've also referred to you in paragraph three to the case of Ruttle, uh, Ruttle and um, the Secretary of State. Um, it's a warning sign that if you are going to assign uh, claims, please make sure that your advisors um, uh, do it properly, as in uh, affirm to you and, and, um, uh, and confirm to you that the assignment is proper. When you look at paragraph three, I've given you the extract from uh, the particular offending um, uh, term of the assignment agreement. The court held that the liquidator had actually not assigned what the uh, transfer he thought he was getting. He thought he was getting the ability to sue in his own name. And what the liquidator had actually assigned 
was the right to sue in the name of the company. So the transferee took proceedings in his own name, uh, which, which were challenged, because he'd only got the right to proceed in the name of the company and he hadn't used it. Now that might seem a very technical, pernickety point, but that, the facts of that particular case, it cost an awful lot of money, uh, and clearly it provided um, a, a victory for one of the interested parties. So the case of Ruttle, you'll see, it, it, it's, it's wordy, uh, it's fact-sensitive, but it does remind us that we've got to be very careful with um, assignments. Hugo, can I just ask yes. a question on assignments? In your experience, what's the best way for an insolvency practitioner to try and protect themselves from the risk of adverse costs once the claim has been assigned? You know, I'm thinking of circumstances where um, the claim goes across um, and the, the insolvency practitioner thinks they're out of it, they've, had, they've sort of agreed a position on the split of the proceeds of the recovery. What if something was later to go wrong in the litigation? Um, would, it, you know, would it be the usual sort of indemnity type provisions that you want to be assigned them to? The only way in which, yes, you could you'd protect yourself would be looking, looking to rely on an indemnity clause. There's been a recent authority, I think it's about 18 months old, two years old, the name I've, I've forgotten, and it may be that the, uh, the delegate is asking about that particular case. Uh, it's clearly correct that once you assign it, it doesn't mean you can wave goodbye to yeah. all cost consequences. I mean, that's the point behind the, the question. And it's absolutely right that, that I, I should draw that to your attention. You will see when we come on to, in the notes, in paragraph 7, the general rules of costs under the civil procedure rules apply, which means, and this isn't going to be helpful, it's completely discretionary. The court has a complete discretion on costs. So if something has been assigned by an insolvency practitioner who's still retaining an interest, say a 30% interest, and it turns out it was an absolute, um, the cause of action involved was, was, was completely uh, wrongful, let's say, uh, and, or there's some other um, uh, negative feature about it, the court could decide to make a cost order not only against the assignee who's taken the action, but also against anybody who's interested in the litigation. Because the court can make a non-party costs order. And if you look to paragraph, um, uh, paragraph 7, you'll see the reference to the general rules of cost. And if you look to paragraph 12 of the notes, there's also the provision under uh, rule uh, CPR 48 part, 48 part 44, the court can make a non-party costs order. So the practical question, what can you do to insulate yourself in an assignment and clearly have a viable and enforceable indemnity? But I, I don't know that you could do anything more. Because, for instance, if you, if you uh, monitor, if you require the litigation to be monitored by you and reported to you, uh, then there might be a question uh, raised later on. The court might say, well, you're still involved in this action, so that might backfire on you. If you uh, have assigned it or, uh, and you still have a control over the litigation, similarly the court might still say you're involved in the litigation. So uh, I'd say you'd have to be looking at an indemnity. Um, if we can just go back to the, still on the first um, slide, um, paragraph 4 refers to White, the case of Whitehouse and Wilson. And this is really important in the context of assignments. That was a case where a liquidator was faced with, let's, let's, let's I'll use the word al alleged naughty director and uh, the alleged good director. And the court was faced with a complaint made by the good director that the liquidator had sold, had assigned the company's right of action against the naughty director to guess who? The naughty director. The naughty director, who the company should have been suing, according to the good director, had bought the cause of action of the liquidator after a process of bidding had gone on. And the good director went to the Court of Appeal on this, actually, as far as the Court of Appeal said, there's a public interest here that the liquidator has not taken account of. There's a public interest in making wrongdoers pay. And even though my bid was not as good as the wrongdoers did, it should have been accepted. Now, the Court of Appeal actually upheld 
the court's decision, the lower court's decision, that the liquidator was completely in the right, and so he wasn't criticised. But, excuse me, what the Court of Appeal said, in a case where you've got a right of action against a misfeasant director, you've got to show due process. You have to show that you've offered it to all those interested parties. And the difficulty in the White House, the White House and Wilson case for the good director was that his offer actually was complicated and it wasn't clean, as well as not being more than the naughty director's offer. Um, but you have to show, in not in every case, and this is where the guidance is a little bit woolly, I'm afraid, but you have to think about the public interest in uh, fighting the good fight, as it were, on behalf of, of um, parties who are against the naughty director. So White House and Wilson said, you've got to go through this check procedure, and you certainly have got to offer the, offer the right of action around. Um, paragraph 5 of the notes, I go back to CFAs and uh, DBAs, and the beauty of the CFA, obviously, is that a no-win-no-fee agreement. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. There's still an exemption from the Jackson reforms uh, for about another year. So we can still claim premiums from the other side and uh, uplifts uh, from the other side uh, in the normal way. But that's set to disappear. And so we'll be on the same playing field as every other uh, uh, litigant in civil procedure. And, and, although there is a bit of a rearguard action being, being fought at the moment. And the, the philosophy is that people should be turning to damage-based agreements. The difference between a conditional fee agreement is that if you win, you can get an uplift of your hourly, hourly rate. And I should also say, for those of you, uh, for those insolvency practitioners amongst you who have not done this, you can agree with the creditors in, litig in, in, in these litigation cases. You can agree an uplift. An uplift is not just for the lawyers under a CSA. I've been involved in a number of cases where the creditors have quite happily accepted that the liquidator is doing this on, essentially on a flyer, and they've agreed an uplift on the fees. The CFA, though, is a formal document that has to be entered into with your solicitor, and then the solicitor has to enter into it with counsel. So you get an uplift on your fees, but you cannot share the cake, the damages or the compensation. And what's going to be happening is that damage-based agreements are now, are, are now introduced. And in solvency cases, I think the figure is you can, you can, you can, the lawyers can uh, seek to agree up to 50% of the damages of the recovery. I'll let a sharp intake of breath there, I realize, around the nation. Uh, and um, that means it's gone over to the American system. We've had a halfway house for years. In America, for decades, lawyers have been on damage-based agreements, and that's what we've gone to. And so whether or not, you know, we, there's a place for mor morality in insolvency law, which there is actually, as Harry Patu runs through it, and we are now in the era, potentially, of damage-based agreements. It may be, as I say, R3 um, uh, salvage the, the, the uh, CFAs uh, and the, the ordinary rules that are applying, um, um, uh, but we don't know that yet. Um, CFAs are very valuable because they can see off a security for cost application if one is made. Um, a CFA can be made in the name of a company, obviously, as for company claims as well as office holder uh, claims. Um, okay, um, and Wright, Hassel, and Morris, I, I, I give you that case in paragraph five. Wright, Hassel is actually not a, a state of mind, it's a, it's a firm of solicitors and they made a CFA uh, with an insolvency practitioner, and the insolvency practitioner, they, they, the litigation was won, a settlement of £194,000 was made. Uh, Wright Hassel then put in their legal bill of £134,000, and the insolvency uh, practitioner uh, fought it, and uh, didn't pay it, and he was sued. And Wright Hassel won in the Court of Appeal on the basis the CFA there had been entered into by the insolvency practitioner personally. He had not entered into it on behalf of the company. And so he was the person to whom Wright Hassel could look. Now that's not the greatest marketing tool for a firm of solicitors to sue the insolvency practitioner. Obviously the parties had fallen out big time. But what that reinforces to me, and I can say with all the people I've worked with, um, it's more about trust and the relationship between the parties or amongst the parties. 
Um, you can't go into these, I don't go into these cases on the basis of the black letter of the CFA agreement. You have to trust people to a certain extent, and I certainly do, and that's the way I've found that these, these um, arrangements work. But when it comes to it, if you fall out, there is that danger there. And I also refer you to paragraph 6 uh, to the Wedgwood Museum case, is that you've got to watch out when you go into litigation. When you instruct uh, solicitors and instruct counsel, you've got to be careful that you're doing it for a proper reason, it's proportionate, it's the right thing to do. The Wedgwood case was in Birmingham where a leading counsel had been instructed to attend a three-day directions hearing. Um, uh, and the judge said, and the leading counsel agreed when the judge said on the first day, you're not needed, what are you needed for? And leading counsel says, well, I'm not needed. It was an application for directions, and there were several leading counsel there already for interested parties. And so leading counsel said, well, I'm not, I'm not actually needed. And then the administrator at the end of the case claimed the whole of the brief fee for that leading counsel. Now, the brief, it might have been that the judge was slightly influenced by the brief fee for a three-day applications uh, hearing in, in Birmingham of £45,000, and the refresher was £6,000 a day. Um, but what the judge said is that, look, if you employ leading counsel, um, you've got to make sure it's an appropriate case. Uh, and this has been said a number, on a number of occasions, in fact, lately by the Supreme Court in the Eurosale case. And if you, as administrator in this case, employ uh, a leading counsel and you don't need to, not only are you not going to get the cost of the, um, you're not going to, um, the, the costs are not going to be ordered against the other side, as it were, or out of whatever fund we're talking about, but they're disallowed. They can't be claimed as an expense of the administration. So going into litigation, insulating yourself, choice of legal advisors is extremely important. And the moral is, I think, work with people that you trust. Okay, well, you'll be happy to hear, we're going on to the second slide, motoring along now. And this is about personal liability for uh, legal costs. And what I've done, and you'll see in the notes in detail, is I've divided it, it up and I've considered the position of the office holder as litigant and the office holder as respondent and then litigation in the name of the company. The first point I want to make in paragraph 7, I've already made it, is the normal CPR rules of cost generally apply. So there are various principles, but it's all a movable feast. The normal principle is loser pays the winner. Regard has to be had for the conduct of the parties. The courts can adopt an issue-by-issue -issue approach. Um, have there been any payments into court? What, have, what situation of the office? What I would say to you going into litigation is that you've got to be very much more careful now of how you pitch a claim, what quantum you, um, what quantum you claim. If you over-egg the pudding, you can be criticised and costs can be disallowed. Your conduct of the proceedings, all these factors make it very discretionary as to what costs will be ordered and against whom. Um, so those, that's the CPR. Um, Paragraph 8, um, I refer to uh, uh, an argument that I was trying to run recently in a case called Earp, James, James Earp, as he's retired now, of Grant Thornton against Curd. It's a 2013 case where we had been faced, I was acting for James Earp as trustee in bankruptcy, we were faced with a, a pretty dishonest shower of people on the other end of various examinations and litigation. It lasted, it's still the cost hearing actually happening next week on it. Um, and we, I decided to claim, as a sort of head of compensation, um, the, the costs that have been wasted, the time costs, or some of the time costs, of the insolvency practitioner, because he'd been lied to right, left, and centre, and I can say this publicly because it's in the judgment that recently came out in it, as, as, as a head of claim. Now, there, is, there are actually cases in a tortious and contractual context where employers have claimed for their own in-house management time that's been wasted in dealing with a claim. That's the aerospace case that I refer to in paragraph 8. So I try to transfer that to an insolvency situation. We've all had them, where you've been led up the garden path or you've been lied to. You've spent an awful lot of your time, your colleagues' time. Who's going to pay for that? 
the judge in the Earp case um, actually didn't like that at all. Um, uh, it, it, at present, it's not being uh, appealed, but there is another, there is another um, instalment, if you like, of the case to happen next week. So watch this space. So the general principle he didn't like. So if anybody out there would like to um, send me a query in or a reference in saying they've run that point and they've been successful on it, I'd love to hear. But I couldn't find a single case on it. It's a big issue, actually, in cases where you've got absolutely absolute rogues on the other side who run up a, a lot of time costs. Um, so, office holder as a respondent, it's going to say something about that. There is a specific rule of 7.39, if you're not liable, if you're on the wrong end of some proceedings as, a, as an insolvency practitioner, unless the court otherwise directs, and it would be an extremely unusual case where you're brought into litigation as a defendant, respondent, and you're made liable to pay the cost. And you'll see I give you a case reference in paragraph 9 on that Morden. So that's where you, Larry Liquidator, or uh, Andrea Administrator, are personally the respondent. Um, if you then look to the position of office holder as applicant, uh, paragraph 10, Wilson Lovett, there's no magic, I'm afraid. There's no recognition of the superhuman efforts you sometimes have to make as an insolvency practitioner to make a claim stick against some rogues. There's no public policy that gives you any insulation where your name is as an applicant uh, if you lose. So that's why I do, I do realise you don't litigate to increase your social life and you must be insured and insulated before you uh, enter any, liquid, any litigation. Uh, and that's because you're personally liable if you're named Larry Liquidator against Derek Director. Um, in the name of the company, not the name of the roads, in the name of the company, if you run proceedings in the name of the company, let's say you've got a breach of duty claim against a director, you could either issue it as a Larry Liquidator against Derek, Dire uh, Derek Director as, an, as a misdemeanor application, or you could issue it in the name of X Limited in liquidation against Derek Director. Which do you do? Well, if you issue in the name of the company, you are not the litigant. You're giving the instructions, you're pushing it, you're progressing it, you're not the litigant. And unless you've done something deranged or acted unreasonably, like Mr. Corkwell has said, don't go on with this, and you have, you might run into a problem. And the problem would be and the references are in paragraph 12, will be a third-party cost order, because you're not a party to the litigation. And it's pretty difficult to get a third-party cost order. Um, and, and I give you the references in paragraph, um, in paragraph 12. Um, so, if you issue proceedings in the name of the company, what the defendant should do is apply for security for costs. And if they don't apply for security for costs, normally, there be no reason why you'll be made personally liable. Now, I then go on to discontinuance. So, that's, is that the next slide? Yes, discontinuance. If you, were, if you issue against some directors, whether it's in, in the... Well, if it's in the name of the company, then you're not personally liable. So, let's take the easier case of where you have issued an, a misfeasance application in your own name. And you decide to discontinue it as soon as you serve a notice of discontinuance, you're liable for costs, unless you can persuade the court otherwise, and it's a big uphill task. It doesn't matter that new information has come and changed your view of the case. You don't litigate unless you're damn sure you've got a good case. And the price you pay if you want to discontinue, you pay costs. Now, in one case I've got at the moment, for instance, new information, we've had to issue to preserve a limitation period, we haven't served, new information has come to light, so what I've advised is not to serve a notice of discontinuance, because that would initiate a cost application, rather, um, what I've said is just ask the court to dismiss it, it's not been served, so no costs have actually been incurred on the other side. If you serve a notice of discontinuance, even though they've not been served, you know what's going to happen? They're going to bowl up at the return date, they will actually... Yeah, we, 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 it wasn't served on us, but we have done work in relation to the letter before action that's been sent. 
So the best thing to do is, if you haven't served it, is to just get it dismissed and get it taken out of the court's list. And there's a, a well-known case in paragraph 16 on Walker and Walker, um, where a liquidator applied to discontinue. There are rare cases uh, where there are rare cases where the court will discount. If you discontinue, where, where the court will discount your liability. The Rostoggi case, Rostoggi, that's paragraph 17, um, where um, the court um, said, well, the liquidator's got to pay the cost of discontinuance, but we're going to limit it. Because what the defendant did there, when he heard it was going to be discontinued, said, I don't agree to this discontinuance. I don't, the, the liquidator, um, um, sorry, the, the defendant in that case said, the liquidator wanted to um, uh, discontinue the case. He said, well, I want to be a public statement, publicised in national newspapers, exonerating me and saying what a lovely chap I was, and the liquidator was completely wrong to litigate against me. And the court said that's unreasonable. And so they discounted the cost that the liquidator would otherwise pay. Now, the next slide is... Is that the next slide, Andrew? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. The next slide is our adverse cost and super priority. And I've given you a couple of references uh, there in paragraphs 18 and 19. I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on this. This is basically the point, that if you continue litigation, let's say you're in liquidation and you continue li li litigation in the name of the company, um, uh, that, that um, there are situations in which the defendant, if they're successful, can claim priority for their costs over the liquidation expenses. So the company before liquidation has been running an, uh, running an action, the liquidator decides to continue the, uh, continue the action, and he loses. The defendant will get costs, and that in itself, just getting the order for costs, will give him priority over your expenses. So the moral is, if the company you go into is litigation, if you dip your toe in that litigation, you run a risk of being held to have continued the litigation, and therefore if the defendant gets a cost order against you for the historic costs, that can rank above your remuneration. So it's something you have to watch out for. Can I just remind everyone at this stage, if we do have questions for Hugo, please can you send them through the chat, and we'll put them up as we run through the seminar. Okay. Or questions for Andrew. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Security for costs, applications, and funding issues. Now, there has been a bit of a resurgence in security for costs applications. Where this applies is the situation where proceedings, excuse me, have been, are issued by a company in liquidation. So you've issued proceedings X Limited in liquidation against Derek Director. Derek Director's worried, or he says he's worried, that if he wins, he doesn't have any cost protection because the company's in liquidation and it's got no assets. And the court will, it's a balancing exercise, consider excuse me, whether the liquidator, or rather the company in liquidation, should put priority for those costs. Now, if Larry Liquidator has taken the proceedings against Derek Director, this doesn't, this doesn't happen. Because Derek Direct can always go against Larry Liquidator personally, so you can't have a security for cost application. I still get this, where Derek Director <coughs> says to the liquidator, we want security for costs, but it can't happen, because you're personally liable. That's good news and bad news, obviously, there. But if you've issued proceedings in the name of the company, inevitably you'll see a security for cost application. And I, I, I refer to the... Uh, Paragraphs 20 and, and, and 22, and Aquila Design is one of the leading cases where normally the liquidator runs the um, defence for that application to say, well, if you order security for costs, it will stifle this action against this, this naughty director. And so uh, that's, that's one way of trying to defend it. The other way of defending it is saying, here's a CFA backed by an insurance policy, or here's a bond from an insurance company. Uh, a company or a funder saying they'll pay the cost if things go wrong. I don't, I don't know if you've had any recent experience under security for cost applications, but 
I, I think they are on the rise for, for obvious reasons. Yeah, I think we've seen more of those coming through, Hugo. Uh, we've actually got one at the minute where we um, act for an administrator of a company that has been sued, uh, the action being taken in the name of the company. We've actually looked at the claimant in the litigation for security protection. So we looked at it slightly from the opposite angle, really. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I also refer, you'll see at paragraph 22, to the case of Wu and Hellard, um, which involved uh, an insolvency practitioner who had a security for cost application uh, made against, his, against uh, the company in liquidation that he was a liquidator of. And one of the arguments was, well, um, uh, the, the fact is you've got a CFA there, you've got an adverse cost policy there, clearly that means that the company is completely um, insolvent, it's got no money, and that in itself should be a reason for ordering security. And we don't like the CFA because it might not be enforceable, because the insurer might void the policy for some reason. And the court saw all that off. The court said the mere fact that you enter a CFA with your advisors does not mean that's in support of a security for cost application. And that pe professional people and CFA backed by insurance um, policies from, from regular insurance companies um, uh, are not going to be nitpicked over to, to, um, uh, to avoid, as it were. So uh, there the, the court um, dismissed the application for security for costs. We then turn to, there's a general uh, heading there in the slide, how to make recoveries. Um, and if I knew the answer to this question, I'd probably have retired by now, I suppose. Um, I, this is a bit of a movable feast. And it's not really legal, substantive issues here, but more practical issues. And the first thing I go back to, and I know I keep banging on about, is choice of legal advisors. And to make sure that the people that you're instructing do this type of work regularly and are in for the medium haul flight or the long haul flight, I think that's really important that you all trust each other and you all play a team approach to it. Now, the second uh, thing to look at is your strategy. What, what resources can you or should you devote to this case and how should you approach things? I'm a great believer in inviting uh, the um, directors in or the third parties in for a chat. Now, this is under Section 235 of the Act. You're not saying you want to privately examine them, which sounds a bit medical, under 236 in front of the core. You just invite them in for a chat. They're duty-bound to come along for a chat. But you can make it in a case where the figures stack up or where, they, where it's a bigger claim. You could make this a bit very early on this request and say, come along with your legal advisors. It will be transcribed. We will have our legal advisors there. It will take half a day, maybe longer. Maybe you get two or three directors in on the same day. And you get the transcripts. And then you say you send the transcripts to them and get them signed off. So it's like a Section 236, but it's not in court. And I've had some very successful examine, uh, uh, chats on that point uh, using that. But it depends. It's not your fifty thousand, hundred thousand pound case, over half a million pound case. Probably you're looking at devoting these sort of resources to. But it pays enormous dividends because what you do is you establish a relationship with your interviewee. They can break off. They can go to a different room. They can take legal advice. They can pick people up. They come back in. The liquidator and his staff and his legal advisors can do the same. And you kind of develop, it's almost, it's almost like um, uh, the Stockholm Syndrome. They, they, they open up. The interviewee starts opening up. I can tell you from personal experience, I've had directors, after an initial stonewalling, you get them talking, get them chatting, get them uh, maybe a bit of a laugh, as it were. I'm not saying to be too light-hearted about it, but they open up. It's about relaxing people. Uh, and then they come out with often come out with gems, and I've certainly, I've certainly had a good experience. I read to Prince and thought he was coming along to talk about defending a wrongful trading um, application. In fact, we had very specific transactions to put to him, and, and he essentially he sang, although he didn't realise, like a canary on it. 
Now, there are situations where you're going to drag people to go under 236, but it's not. I'm not a great believer in 236 for examinations. I think 236 is very good for applying to get hold of documents and get hold of um, 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 affidavits, perhaps, by people, but not really to examine people. It's a last resort. I had one where the director came in and gave us a very good, um, a, lo a lot of evidence on, on claims against him, actually, that we could make. And then about two weeks later, when, when he got the tr sent the transcript back, he said, I'm refusing to sign this because at the time of the uh, court hearing, um, I was on prescription for Prozac and had also been drinking. So I, I'm not, I, didn't, I wasn't quite clear on what I was saying. Well, sounds unbelievable, but if you get to court, people can say that and people can withdraw things they said and courts can be terribly understanding. It's really irritating actually sometimes, but um, that does happen. So I, I, I think it's about... You know the approach that you're going to use. You've got to be. You've got to look to very carefully. I don't know if you have a particular way of approaching it, Andrew. On, on, on no, on I, do, I would tend to agree with you. I mean, we we are of the view that best to try and get the uh, opponent to the litigation in and try not to formulate the claim too prematurely. I mean, we're often instructed on the basis of um, an intensive practice and saying we think we have a cause of action. Um, let's go on and draft a a letter of claim, uh, we're always of the opinion that we should try and sort of get the director to come into a meeting in the office to try and go through, um, you know, the issues pretty much as you've described. So it is a very useful exercise to spend that bit of extra time at the outset um, because, you know, at the very least what we're trying to do is to establish that we have, actually have generally got what we think we've got. You know, a review of the documents and the papers will suggest one thing but actually sitting down in front of the director uh, and having that conversation, understanding where he's coming from and what, what angles of attack we might have uh, coming our way is an incredibly useful um, bit of time spent, to be honest. Yeah, they sometimes come out with stuff like I had one director who asked, uh, what, what are all these entries for the Savoy Hotel for breakfast? Um, and the guy said, uh, it was the, the father was the main director and he was deceased, it was the son who was the director I was interviewing. And he said, well, we, were, we had breakfast at the Savoy when we used to go, we used to take the car up to Scotland. And, uh, right, okay, well, why do you have breakfast at the Savoy? This is all out of the company's money. He said, well, because my father said that was the nearest place to get a decent, nearest place to Kings, uh, to Euston to get a decent breakfast was the Savoy. Now that, that sounds silly, and we did have a little bit of a laugh about it, but that paid a lot of dividends when that was put in evidence against him. I mean, a great rule for writing a letter, you know, top tip for writing a letter, is actually imagine your letter that you're writing, whoever you're writing it to, it's going to be read out in court. And if you decide to respond to a letter by stroking it through and saying this is a load of B dot dot dot, uh, and that's read out in court. It's not going to be great. Similarly, this director looked uh, looked like he was completely um, um, just looking after his own interests and his family interests. Um, I've had um, uh, directors, um, 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 uh, you know, trying to explain transactions and getting into terrible difficulty when you just put documents over the table to them and get their reaction to it. You have a bundle on these. On if you go to um, do a big examination, you'll have a bundle of core documents that you hand over to the director and ask him to explain it. So it's is. And, and also, if you feel that you've got a good claim, and often, not often, but yeah, quite often I feel there's a pretty good claim here anyway, and actually the interview is the icing on the cake. I'm a few, I've been consulted maybe a year into the job. I still think there's room for interviewing these people. But before I go into the interview, I've actually structured out with the solicitor and the IP, this is the claim I'd like to make. Let's see, let's see what he says about these things. And then on one case I had, after interviewing this guy for a day, three weeks later, we hit him with a freezing injunction. Well, it was a case of how much do you want? You know, so it, it depends. It's not, they're not all, you know, they don't, I think you always get something out of talking uh, to people. I um, mean, that sounds a bit sort of new age, but um, it does help in this insolvency situation. Um, if I can then pass to, oh, asset intelligence, by the way, absolutely crucial. Typical barrister, not talking about asset intelligence. That's your first question. Um, and it's got to be as good as you can get. 
Um, I've had a case where the IP was told by a police officer that David Arthur Robertson owned a farm with his sister in Leicestershire. And David Arthur Robertson turned up for a mediation and offered us a very low figure. And we said, what about this farm in Leicestershire you own with, 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 with your sister? And he says, what farm? And it turns out this J David Arthur Robertson was a different David Arthur Robertson to the person whose, whose name was on the title deeds. True story. And, and that made us, we went into the mediation um, wanting 200 and came out with 50. Um, so you'd, sometimes people give you the wrong intelligence and we can all, we've all got war stories about that. So you've got to be as careful as you can. If we can then pass to undertakings in damages and freezing injunctions, this is a bit of a growth area. I'm a big fan of using freezing injunctions if you've got the evidence, obviously. I'm willing to do the work to go for a freezer, and it's an intense amount of work over sometimes a two or three week period to get a freezing injunction, because if you freeze the other side, they can't move their assets. You notify the bank, you notify the restriction of the land registry, they can't move their assets. It does not give you a proprietary interest. That's the downside. Practically speaking, you have them where you want them, but it doesn't give you any priority. So you've got to bear that in mind. And when you go for a, a, a freezing injunction, typically you want to give a limited undertaking in damages. This is where you've got to say to the court, well, if you give us the injunction, we undertake that if it turns out you shouldn't have given us the injunction, we'll pay damages to the other side. And normally what I try and do is limit that to the assets in the estate, i.e. at that point, nil. Now, different judges take different approaches. I did one in Newcastle recently, actually, where the judge said, well, they can argue about that on the return date. That was very helpful, because I was wanting to argue we shouldn't have to um, we should either limit it to the assets of the estate or we should give very limited fortification. In that case, we said we could get £10,000 from the revenue um, to fortify the undertaking. And the court was disposed to accepting that. The court said, let's wait for the return day. Uh, the return day was a bit of a non-event because they you know, departed the jurisdiction. But we have frozen two properties which is, and we've got land registry restrictions. And in the notes, it's, it's um, paragraph um, 32 of the notes, I'll give you the reference to the restriction that you should um, register at the land registry. Um, it's all a matter of full and frank disclosure to the court. And, and if, you, if you say to the court, look, this is a very strong case, um, there's been no explanation for the director's conduct, a lot of people have been ripped off here, and I've been dealing with a few land banking cases recently, and, and there's a case that I quote you called uh, Michael Nassimakis, um, where the uh, court took into account that the people who've been ripped off here were lots of ordinary individuals. Um, that in those sorts of situations, um, the, uh, and you also could say maybe that it would stifle the action if um, you had to give, if you had to fortify the undertaking. The court may not require fortification. So I start from the proposition of no fortification and limit the undertaking to the assets of the estate and see where the judge wants to uh, go on that. Right. Um, I'd also, just for your note, if you just look to paragraph 31 of my notes, you'll see a statutory reference to a provision under which the revenue can give you information about um, uh, the assets of a target. Now, it's a very limited application, but in one case I'm dealing with at the moment, the revenue gave us quite a bit of information about a naughty director. We were a liquidator of a company. The revenue were the biggest creditor, so they looked upon it as a tax collection exercise. We got information about the director. Unfortunately, half of the information was correct and half was incorrect, but hey-ho. Um, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm elbowing Andrew as well as I'm trying to read things, sorry. Um, the next slide is litigation and sanction uh, for proceedings. And I give you these references in paragraphs 33 to 36 of the, um, of the notes about when you need sanction and when you can get retrospective sanction. Um, basically, um, you do need sanction for bringing legal proceedings for officeholder claims. 
and you get the sanction from the creditors or the court. You don't need sanction for bringing an action in the name of the company, but ordinarily you'd want to get it if it's possible. You want to get it, but you don't actually need sanction if it's in the name of the company. And you now no longer need sanction for a compromise of proceedings. <coughs> but I'd always make a compromise, well, not always, but I, I tend to want to make a compromise dependent on the creditors saying, the creditors saying um, it's okay. Um, but technically, under Schedule 4, Paragraph 6A, Schedule 4, Paragraph 6A, you don't need sanction. If you forget to get sanction, you can get retrospective sanction. It's not a rubber stamp procedure, but there's a case called Gresham and Mooney says you can get retrospective sanction. And there is a particular provision under the insolvency rules if you haven't got sanction and you're quick about it, you go to court quickly, they'll give you sanction. And that's um, Rule 4.184. Rule 4.184. All the references are in the notes. A couple of then uh, slides left, just to briefly draw your attention to the position of floating charge holders. I've got this on a couple of cases at the moment. There are provisions under the rather oddly titled Section 176ZA of the Insolvency Act that are important. I've not made up that section number. It does exist. Basically, floating charge assets, the basic philosophy is that the expenses of the liquidation take over uh, the floating charge. Um, that's a general principle. These provisions say exceptions can be made, and exceptions have been made in the rules, and all the references are given to in your notes. They say if you want to use property subject to a floating charge, if you want to use property subject to a floating charge, if you want to use floating charge assets to pay litigation expenses, you have to get authority from the floating charge holder or the court. Right? Now, you can see if you've got some kit that's subject to a floating charge and you want to sell it, then yes, you should go and ask the floating charge holder for permission. But the way that the legislation and the rules are stated, you have to get permission or ratification from the floating charge holder or the court if you're going to use property comprised in or subject to a floating charge, that would mean a claim against a director, or arguably would. So I've got a claim, expletive liquidation as a claim against Derek Director. Let's say you litigate against him and you get £400,000 settlement. There's a shortfall for the floating charge holder. You haven't consulted him. The floating charge holder says, well, I'm not giving you permission to use all that money for legal costs. I'm not, you have to go to court and fight about it. Because the provisions say you have to have authority or ratification for if you use property subject to a floating charge. And under the normal debenture, property under a floating charge includes rights of action of the company. So watch out if you're litigating where there's a floating charge shortfall. And then finally, um, update on clawback claims and directors. I'll just, in, in the time available, just go, I know we're coming up near the end, and if there are any questions, I would like you know, to, to be able to answer them. I've given you some cases uh, in paragraphs 41 to 43. Shadow directors, very important, this case of Vivendi, Vivendi, shadow directors. It's now clear that the courts are moving to say shadow directors owe duties, not wholly in the same way as ordinary directors, but they're getting there. So if shadow directors now appear to be subject to the, the old common law and fiduciary duties, at least to some extent, and they never have been before. So there's been a great movement in, in attacking shadow directors. It's not just for wrongful trading now. You could do them, it seems, in the right circumstances, for a breach of an ordinary director's duty of care or fiduciary duty. And then the second area I draw your attention is insolvency. Uh, you may be familiar with the Eurosale case. Now, that's an interesting case for me as a non-accountant, because what it did was it said, 
The courts have been talking of proving the point of no return for insolvency, and the court just said, forget that. We don't use that point of no return test anymore. But what the court also said was that, in effect, brackets around the bottom of balance sheet doesn't necessarily mean the company is insolvent. Now, I can see here accountants falling off the chairs around the country, but it's, about, it's the start of an inquiry. And that means there's a lot of scope now for defendants, wriggle, more wriggle room for defendants to argue that the company wasn't insolvent at the time that the brackets say it's insolvent. And that's been, it's been recently followed in the HLC case. And so I think that's an interesting case to look at. And then finally, I've given you a couple of cases on transactions and underbanks, including the Overton case, where the insolvency practitioner came in for a huge amount of criticism in, he's said to have thrown a lot of mud at the defendant in the hope that it might stick whilst using the pressure of a CFA. It was a paradigm case of how not to conduct a CFA case, um, but it also had a little bit to say about transactions and undervaluers of interest. Um, the line run there by way of defence that there was no transaction between the company and the defendant, but it was quite a fact-sensitive case. Right, I realise I've been motoring a bit and probably my dull northern monotone has probably sent some people off, but um, I hope you've got something from that. If you haven't already seen the notes, you will see all the references there. Uh, if you do have any queries, uh, please do, you can send a question in, um, or you can email Andrew at Muckles or myself at Enterprise with any uh, sort of uh, queries that you've got or any comments that you've got, quite happy to receive them. And I hope you found it um, uh, an interesting experience. Thank, thank you very much, Hugo. Um, we're delighted that Hugo has joined us today. Uh, I think that's been a very interesting um, period of time well spent, um, some really useful tactical information on how to conduct insolvency litigation. Um, the slide in front of you at the minute is just really a run through of our post webinar sort of procedures. We are going to send out to you a link to a recording of this webinar in the event that you want to show that to some other colleagues within your teams who haven't been able to join you today um, and use that for future training references. Um, in terms of contacts, um, there is a LinkedIn insolvency and turnaround uh, group which. Um, Remote within Muckle, which um, we'd be delighted if you could look up and, and join that and participate in some of the ongoing debates. Um, in terms of um, our e-newsletter, again, we can any contact from yourself, we can sign you up for the e-news and, and take that forward. What I'd like to do now is just run through a um, question or two that have, that's popped in since we've been on the, the webinar. Some of them I've stored up till the end. Um, there was a, a reference that somebody picked up to the comments you made, Hugo, about the right tassel uh, case, and I think that ties into some of the questions that you've raised about choice of, uh, of, of sort of lawyer. Uh, I think in that case, the QC who'd been ins instructed, the court was of the opinion that that um, wasn't sort of an appropriate level of, of expertise for the particular authority in question. The real question that I suppose the intelligence practitioner has posed here is how as an IP can you protect yourself from criticism, you know, in the event that you those decisions that are made are, are, are wrong in the eyes of the court? Is there any sort of pre um litigation steps or, you know, any dialogue that can be commenced to find out how to take that you know, how best to play that, really? Yes, there is actually, and that's a very uh, useful question. The case was actually the Wedgwood case, was the one about the silk not getting 45k for his day out in Birmingham, which I think is a manifest miscarriage of justice. But um, there we have it. Um, so uh, what the judge said in that case um, is that there is clear guidance that you should consider very carefully when you use leaving counsel and when you don't. But he said if there's any, it's paragraph 21 of the Wedgwood decision. He says, if they were administrators were in any doubt as to the role, what role they should play, the matter could have been raised informally by letter to the court, explaining the intended role of the, the silk they were going to instruct and the other silks. So that's the way to do it. Actually, that's a very user-friendly decision. 
if you've got any doubt on that particular question. I mean, other questions about, you know, how you approach a case and are, are normal use for solicitors and counsel to give you advice on. But that suggestion on that particular point, the judge himself said, look, if there's any doubt about this, this directions hearing, I've got all and sundry in front of me. I mean, I, I remember being involved in the BA Yachts PLC case about deposits, customer deposits on these yachts. And counsel in that case, was about 15 counsel of which I was one. And we were popping in and out of the hearing, not attending certain days and attending others. So you can manage a timetable properly. So that's the way to do it right to the court. You know, don't send an email to the judge saying, dear judge, do it through your solicitors. Oh, that's great, Hugo. Well, thank you very much for answering that question. The, I'm going to uh, draw the, co the web seminar to a close now at this stage. I'd like to thank you very much for participating in the web seminar. This has been a really uh, successful event. We've had um, sort of over 60 delegates signed up from across the country. We're delighted with the fact that uh, all of you out there are looking to participate in what we're trying to do. We are going to roll out future events and we'll have further uh, guest speakers who we're going to line up to come and join us, so watch out for further updates. Uh, but at this stage, I'd like to draw the proceedings to a close. Once again, thank you very much for joining in and also thank Hugo for giving up his valuable time to join us today and take part in this web seminar. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.